We have a fantastic agenda planned for you today that will include an opening keynote, some remarks on digitalization and, and sustainable consumption from myself, a virtual tour of the new platform, a dynamic panel, and closing remarks. And we're going to pack all of this into the next one hour and 15 minutes. So without further delay, let me hand it over to Charles Arden Clark. He's working for UNAP. He's the head of the 10YFP Secretariat and the One Planet Network. Um, he's also coordinating uh, the SDG uh, uh, hub uh, that we're going to be um, exposed to and launched today. So Charlie, over to you. As an overarching objective of and a prerequisite for sustainable development at both the World Summit on Sustainable Development in 2002 and the Rio Plus 20 conference uh, in 2012. Current unsustainable patterns of consumption and production are driving many of the global crises that we face, including those of biodiversity loss, climate change and pollution. And they're also driving other impacts like the emergence of zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19. According to the International Resource Panel, in overall terms, the extraction and processing of natural resources accounts for more than 90% of global biodiversity loss and water stress impacts and approximately 50% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, SDG 12 on ensuring sustainable consumption of production patterns is in fact an enabler for the whole of the 20 or 30 agenda. This SDG is about measuring, understanding and reducing our, our resource and the resource use and the associated environmental impacts. This goal and sustainable consumption and production policies enable solutions at various levels and in key resource and in pollution intensive sectors, including among those solutions, the implementation of the global cooperation framework on sustainable consumption production, known as the 10 year framework of programs on sustainable consumption production and fulfillment of commitments that have been made on pollution control, chemicals, uh, national policies and investments uh, to change production patterns and policies such as sustainable public procurement and more sustainable business practices. These solutions which require a whole range of stakeholders, public and private, can drive key change in sectors identified in SDG 12 and in other SDGs. Among those key sectors are food, tourism, education, energy, transport. And the kind of means that are deployed to promote sustainable consumption of production are reduction of or elimination of harmful subsidies on fossil fuels, specific waste prevention and reduction actions. So SCP is all about responsibility and coordination, engaging governments, businesses and citizens in actions on this critical path to sustainability. Yet, while the importance of sustainable consumption production is very clear, the data we have at present shows we're still moving in the wrong direction. While specific actions have been undertaken to improve the efficiency of resource use in some industries or parts of them, these have not been widely adopted across those industries high impact sectors and value chains. Combined with our continually increasing demand for goods and services, the data on SDG 12 targets clearly shows that we have not yet seen the necessary decoupling of economic growth from environmental degradation. So while sustainable consumption production is recognized as a prerequisite for sustainable development, SDG 12 is not yet being prioritized. Targets and internationally agreed upon indicators on, S on sustainable consumption production were and are being established through the SDGs. Implementing and measuring progress on SCP is a challenge for many member states and the UN too. The lack of data on sustainable consumption production makes it more challenging still for member states to take action and track process. 
So filling the data gap and measuring process progress are the twin challenges that the SDG 12 hub is designed to address. The hub provides member states with a central location for accessing information on SDG 12 targets and indicators, as well as for measuring and reporting progress. This will support those governments in achieving this goal and other SCP related targets across the SDGs. The hub provides clear information on targets and in indicators, accessible and transparent data, as well as direct access to capacity building tools and other resources for reporting progress in sectors. The hub also offers data and support on policies and objectives such as na national sustainable consumption and production policies, material footprint, food loss and waste, waste prevention and reduction. As the custodian or co-custodian of 11 out of the 14 SDG 12 indicators, UNEP has been coordinating the development of this hub. We could not have achieved this without the collaboration of many other UN entities actively involved in supporting and monitoring progress on SDG 12. These include the International Resource Panel, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Convention Secretariat, the Ozone and Montreal Protocol Secretariat, the Minimata Convention Secretariat, the UN Statistics Division, UNITAR, UNCTAD, UNDP, UNESCO and UNWTO. All in all, the SDG 12 hub is a vital interagency initiative and an important step towards strength and collaboration on SDG and sustainable consumption of production more broadly across the UN system. This will deliver coordinated support to member states through the provision of capacity building resources and partnerships, accelerating the shift to sustainable consumption production. The SDG 12 Hub does plays a crucial role in drawing attention to this goal and directly supporting its achievement. Thank you. Back to you, David. Wonderful, Charlie. Thanks very much for setting the context for the Hub. I think that provides an excellent framework for this discussion and for the launch today. Uh, let me just pick up on, on two quick points that you made. I mean, you talked about the SDG 12 as one of the key enabling SDGs. I think we can all agree it is it is foundational and it really underpins the achievement of many of the other goals, if not every other goal, right? If we don't get sustainable consumption and production policy practices and incentives right, we simply cannot achieve sustainable life on land, on water, and many of the other goals indicators. But Charlie, as you pointed out, um, when it comes to measuring progress against the 92 environmental SDGs, we face this, this major challenge, right? If you look at our latest assessment report, um, we concluded that only about 42% of the environmental SDGs have global level data to monitor progress. And that's a huge gap, right? We can't measure or we can't manage what we can't measure. And so, as you said, Charlie, data is a fundamental part of the solution here. And, I, you know, again, as you pointed out, um, what is really shocking about SDG 12 is that despite this fundamental importance, uh, it's been traditionally the, the most underfunded of all the SDG goals. And it's the third most data poor goal in the entire SDG framework. Again, looking back to our recent analysis of measuring progress, if you look at the SDG 12 indicators, at a global level, we can really only measure about 46% of them. So again, major gap. Um, and that's exactly what the SDG hub is designed to help address, right? For the first time ever, we have this consolidated view on major production and consumption trends at the national and global levels. And these insights from the hub can really help us formulate more effective policies. So as you said, this platform really hopes to bring more visibility to the goal and really to help simplify and support national efforts for, for measurement and reporting. So in that basis, in that context, let's move into this first uh, virtual tour of the hub. And we're going to watch a video here to really, really understand the potential power and the, and the framework for this new hub. Welcome to the SDD 12 hub, your central location for Sustainable Development Goal 12 on ensuring sustainable consumption and production. On the SDG 12 hub, you can 
explore SDD targets by themes relevant to you. View progress at national level. And even report directly on SDD 12 if you're a member state. The Hub provides you with all of the methodologies, guidance material, e-learning modules, and capacity development tools you may need to strengthen your national monitoring processes. And you can even access official reporting systems and templates directly through the SDG 12 Hub. Let's take an example. Let's say you're a national focal point on ind indicator 12.1.1 and want to access your guidance on monitoring the indicator as well as understand how you can report on behalf of your country. Let's go to the report page and scroll down to 12.1.1 for SCP policies. Here you'll find all the information you need to move forward on your reporting efforts. And if something is not clear, you can contact the responsible person who can help you with more information. The SDG 12 Hub also serves as a tool for your voluntary national reviews and other types of country analysis. Let's say you're responsible for preparing the progress overview for SDG 12 for your country's voluntary national reviews. The SDG 12 Hub provides all of your official progress information in one central location, providing a consolidated overview of national action on sustainable consumption and production across ministries and other national entities, such as the Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Finance, together with official statistics on national progress. Let's go to the See Progress by Country page and select an indicator we're interested in. Let's have a look at indicator 12.2.2 on domestic material consumption. Here you'll find first an introduction of the indicator, as well as a visualization of national progress that is interactive and, you, and clickable. In addition, you'll find information on the custodian agencies and contact information, guidance material to help you monitor the indicator and report, and related resources. These related resources provides the context to the relevance of the indicator for STD 12 and themes within sustainable consumption and production, such as the SCP HAD, the Global Flows Database, or the Global Resources Outlook, all relevant to dom domestic material consumption. So what if you're working in a business, a civil society organization, a scientific institution, or just generally interested in global progress and how you can contribute to SDG 12? How does the SDG 12 Hub then support you? Let's go to the C progress by target section. This section offers you a consolidated overview of global and regional trends on SDG 12 within themes of interest to you, along with relevant materials that may support your efforts on sustainable consumption and production. That could, for instance, be sustainable tourism. Additionally, the explore action section of the SDG 12 Hub links you to a variety of existing knowledge platforms, databases, online tools, guidelines, and resources, including policy repositories. And thus the Hub is a toolbox of inspiration and opportunities for you to learn, network, share, and inspire others along the way. The SDG 12 Hub is designed to be a continuously evolving platform. And in the coming months, you will see more and more resources and databases, platforms, and networks appear under the Explore Action section. Whether you're working in a large corporation, a small medium enterprise, a civil society organization, or in a national government, this page will offer you access to communities of practice within your areas of interest in sustainable consumption and production. Thank you all for listening to this short introduction of the SDG 12 Hub. We look forward to achieving sustainability together and invite you to visit the SDG 12 Hub at sdg12hub.org. Wonderful, thank you very much for that introduction and, and virtual tour of the platform. If, if colleagues have not yet seen it, it is a very beautiful platform, really easy to navigate and so powerful in terms of easy access to both national data, regional data and global data. It, it truly is magnificent and I would really encourage you after the event to have a look at the platform if you're not watching the soccer game. Of course, if you're watching the soccer game, then maybe tomorrow morning you could have a look at it. Now, let's get into the panel because we have a fantastic set of speakers here that are really going to help us understand uh, how this platform can be used nationally and globally. We're going to talk about the importance of tracking SDG 12. We're going to talk about how the SDG 12 hub can act as a tool to guide national interventions on sustainable consumption and production. And we're going to talk about the importance of looking at the global trends and what, we, what kind of intelligence and insights we can get out of global level data. So let me introduce the fantastic panel of speakers we have tonight. Um, first, we have Mr. Yanis Potochnik. 
He is the co-chair of the International Resource Panel, and they are acting as custodian uh, for SDG indicator 12.2.1 and 12.2.2 on material footprint and on domestic material consumption. Janos, if you could just uh, wave so everybody can uh, see and identify you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Next, we have Mr. Richard Baldwin. He is the head of investment uh, of the research branch and officer in charge of the enterprise branch within the Division on Investment and Enterprise at UNCTAD. And, and I see R Richard, just one more, just one more time, raise your hand. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, and they're acting as custodian for SDG 1261 on sustainability reporting. Next, we have Karen Quintero. If you could raise your hand, Karen, give a little wave. Thank you so much. Uh, she's the director's advisor uh, to the National Administrative Department of Statistics of Colombia. And in, in this department, uh, they're the national focal point for the SDGs, including 12.7. And finally, we have Ms. Annika Lindblom, and she's the director for international affairs at the Ministry of Environment in Finland and part of the group of friends for sustainable consumption and production. And Anika, if you could just, uh, there we go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Welcome panelists. Um, so we're going to keep this, this conversation to about the next uh, 40 to 50 minutes. We're going to try to keep it dynamic and conversational. And so I'd ask the panelists to the extent possible to, to keep your, your interventions kind of short and, and succinct. And we will, uh, we will uh, get to everybody and we will have multiple times to intervene. So let me start with the first question. This is going to be taking things from a global perspective. I'm, I'm really curious to know sort of what are the key trends, either either negative or positive, that we are seeing on SDG 12 and um, in particular on sustainable consumption and production at the global level. I'm going to I'm going to pass that question first to to Yanez. If you could talk about some of the trends that really either trouble you or, or excite you, that would be fantastic. Over to you, Yanez. Thank you, David. I'm sure this audience understands well the importance of natural resource use and their material flows through the economy. And I would uh, sincerely like to congratulate you to this important initiative of creating a central platform to support this understanding. According to IRP, extraction and processing of natural resource materials, and this includes metals, minerals, fossil fuels, and biomass, causes around 90% of land-related biodiversity loss and water stress, 50% of global climate change, as well as one third of the air pollution, as underlined already by Charlie. Consumption footprints in high income countries are more than 10 times higher than in low income countries. They are also approximately 40% higher than in upper middle income countries. Why are these numbers so important? Because they point to the overlooked solution in the battle of the triple planetary crisis, climate biodiversity pollution. The global material demand is projected to double by 2060 if current trends would continue. In no way we can decarbonize all the production, make our economies and society sustainable without massive trade-offs. Therefore, the only realistic chance for reaching our 2030, 2050 targets is to deploy all measures possible to address the likely potential increase. So while we strive to improve our well-being, we must reduce the need for additional virgin natural resources as much as we can. We must decouple well-being and economic growth from natural resources and environmental impacts. Important for all, but definitely urgent for high-income countries. Currently, if you would Google, for example, Emissions Germany or Emissions USA, you would mostly find analysis of emissions by sector, such as energy, industry, transport, or households. While this is certainly useful information, it is not enough to really identify the drivers of these emissions and therefore the most impactful solutions. For example, if you see that industry emissions constitute about a quarter to a third of many countries' emissions, the conclusion is usually that we need to clean up the industrial production by supplying it with renewable energy and capture the pollution. While certainly sensible measure, we could not yet understand where the industrial products actually go, what is their destiny, and how useful they are for the society. So if we look at the emissions along the value chain of materials, we can connect the emissions from extraction, industrial production, retail and use to the ultimate purpose of the material and therefore add solutions that improve the actual purpose of the production. For example, 
Much of industrial emissions are related to the production of steel and cement. Much of the steel goes into underutilized cars, inefficient built cities, or underutilized and under-maintained machinery. Therefore, to eliminate industry emissions, we do indeed need to clean up the production processes, but we also need to use industrial products and implicitly natural resources smarter, making them fundamentally more efficient in how they provide societal function. In short, we need production and consumption solutions underpinned by strong data, and this is a key trend which I think needs more attention. Thank you so much. Those were some really heart-stopping statistics, uh, really gripping numbers you put forward there. I'm going to come back to some of the comments you made in a minute. I wanted to ask um, if, if, uh, if our colleague Richard could also uh, come in with your perspective, Richard, from UNCTAD's perspective. Are you seeing the same kind of negative trends that uh, Janos, that Janos just mentioned, or are you seeing uh, any positive or sort of glimmers of hope at the global level in terms of sustainable consumption and production uh, trends? Um, well, I see both, but let me balance and give you some positive ones. Um, no, seriously. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation for this wonderful event and for um, congratulations on the launch today. Um, of course, we, together with, with UNEP, um, are co-custodians of 12.6, so we'll be looking more at the um, sustainability reporting of companies. Right, and if I look specifically at global trends there, just to um, pick on your, your question there, um, I, I see a few positive trends, right? Um, there is really a, a very big increase in the number of companies that are reporting on sustainability, right? And of course, that's a very, very aggregate indicator and uh, of what the problems are, of course, you know, what level of detail, uh, how comparable, um, what is the quality of reporting, but Let's just, if I just look at the quantity and the, the, the frequency of reporting, this is, here, this is clearly improving a lot. Uh, I think there's, this is happening at, at, at all levels. So um, as drivers, um, I think financial market institutions, uh, regulators, um, uh, securities regulators, uh, etc., are all pushing for this, right? So um, another uh, initiative, just an example where we're also working with UNEP is the Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative. And uh, you see that the number of stock exchanges around the world that has joined has been increasing every year. We're now up to uh, 106 stock exchanges around the world covering all the major ones. And all of these are providing training to their listed firms on ESG reporting. They provide guidance on how to report on sustainability issues. Uh, some of them make it mandatory as a listing requirement, so that really helps um, uh, push companies to, to um, proper and frequent reporting. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and of course, there is also the trend of environmental, social and governance um, indices on the stock exchanges themselves. So if, if firms want to be listed as part of these indices, they have to report. So this, this is one of the uh, trends. Um, another thing that is an another trend that's pushing this a lot is investors themselves, right? So the, the, the number of funds um, uh, reporting or the number of funds that have an ESG slant or that, that have that market themselves as sustainable uh, funds, investment funds, is up to more than four uh, four thousand. There's there's three point two trillion, as we measured in our world investment report this year, um, being managed either through these funds or through uh, other types of uh, financial market instruments with a sustainability slant, such as social or green bonds. So the the the, the capital now being managed. Under this, um, uh, under this, uh, in this field is, is so large it cannot be ignored by companies. So this is really, uh, really pushing up the reporting. And last, um, I think it is also. I mean, we see it in the firms that we look at, uh, including in the smaller firms that might not be listed. Right? Um, for example, we uh, run a large project trying to roll out our. Um, our technical assistance on reporting on 
um, on sustainability issues through our core indicators uh, for for environmental, social, and governance standards. Um, so we do that with SMEs around the world. We do that in developing countries. So we really see that there is take up that companies are trying not just the listed firms that need that need this for regulatory purposes or for uh, approaching investors, but also smaller firms that um, that that really are keen to to take this up. So some positive trends there to uh, to balance the picture. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Richard, I, I want to do a, a couple of follow-up uh, questions on the on the, both of those answers. Uh, you mentioned the the figure of 3.2 trillion in, in ESG, environment, social, and governance funds. I think you're right. That is really important. Uh, if you look at the overall value of the stock market, I think it's around 97 trillion. So, small amount, even though it is increasing. And I guess my question would be, first question would be, is ESG enough uh, in its current configuration, or is there sort of an ESG 2.0? We need to be thinking about that really looks at this question of consumption and how do we basically move to sustainable consumption and circularity. The question I have in follow up is I just want a quick answer from both of you. Where do you see digitalization uh, interplaying in this these global level trends? Do you think digitalization is going to accelerate a consumption, unsustainable consumption, or is it going to accelerate sustainable consumption and, and, and a circular economy? Just a very quick response from, from both of you on, on where you think that trend intersects. Let's start with Yanis. Like any new technology, it would have positive or negative uh, consequences. But if managed well, I consider uh, digitalization as the major opportunity through which we can stimulate the more resource efficient consumption. And in particular, uh, circular economy idea is decades old, but before digitalization happened, it is practically impossible to, to, to foresee that it could be used, for example, for sharing models, for, for empowering consumers and so on. Thanks, Ines. And Richard, where do you stand on the future of digitalization and sustainable consumption and production? Well, um, it's difficult to say. Janus already went into the sort of the, the real effects on consumption and production, of course, and then digital uh, has, the, has a real potential to to make a major improvement. If I look um, at the sort of underlying conditions for improvement, which are also about um, you know, information provision, data availability, uh, reporting, uh, to allow policymakers to make informed decisions on this and push things in the right direction, I think digitalization is also a very important tool that can help um, uh, help on, uh, in terms of more, um, let's say, consistent um, reporting on of companies by companies by producers and consumers on on, um, on sustainable practices. Wonderful. Thank you very much, both for those, those sharing those insights. Uh, Richard, you talked about data, so let's let's actually shift now down from the global level to the national level. My, my next question is is really to all panelists. I, I want to know, like, what are the key challenges in terms of getting access? to national level data and generating actionable insights for specific policy interventions. So let's let's flip it around. Um, let's begin with Annika um, to talk about some of the national level challenges you face in terms of uh, data access and generating actionable insights. Annika? Thank you, David. I would have wanted to tell a bit about the, the positive trends that that I we have figured from the national government point of view, but I, maybe I can come back to that later. Uh, but first of all, of course, to thank you for inviting me to this very important event and, and congratulations to UNEP and other other partners in, in launching this very, very important hub. I'm, I'm sure this is very valuable to, to many actors. But coming to your your question on on the uh, access to global level data and national level data and generating insights for specific policy interventions, of course, the statistical offices are in key position in both national and global data on on SDGs and and for instance, in our case. Uh, in Finland, the statistical office is in charge of coordinating national data from multiple sources to the United Nations and, and also to the Eurostat, the EU uh, uh, statistical office. 
and 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 the statistical statistical offices are also in key position in providing national data sources and identifying and developing national indicators for measuring progress. But maybe the biggest challenge is is really to define and prioritize key indicators to monitor change and to monitor countries impact outside its borders. And, and I think this has been uh, like um, what was said already that I think it was by you, uh, David, that 46% uh, of uh, SDG 12 uh, targets can be measured only. And, and, and I think that this is the, the same challenge uh, uh, remains in, in, in at the national level. Um, and of course, we need robust data, but at the same time, um, um, we would need to present the trends and figures in a way that also political decision makers can understand them. Uh, most importantly, the data has to be in a form that is applicable in political decision making. So I think these these are like um, uh, two, two uh, aspects uh, or two sides of the same coin, uh, but equally important. And, and from a policy planner perspective, uh, I think this is very important that the, the, the data is also applicable to political decision makers. And lastly, there is maybe not a single indicator or, or the indicator giving advice or insights for policy interventions for, for SDG 12, for instance. Uh, uh, and we have seen, for example, um, uh, and we have uh, been discussing years to develop alternative indicators to GDP for measuring well-being. And, and we have seen that it has been a never-ending story. Uh, and, and in Finland, we have, for instance, um, uh, solved this, this challenge by having a dashboard of indicators that are connected to national targets uh, for, for sustainable consumption and production. So there are, uh, there are ways in which to, to really tackle these complex issues and, and also measure change, but it is not easy. Thank you so much, Annika. And you've really piqued my curiosity now. Can you just speak very, very quickly about the Finnish context? The indicators that you are collecting, are you mm. seeing positive trends or, or negative trends or a mix of both? Well, mix of both. Uh, but to be honest, um, in Finland, like in many other northern countries, SDG 12 is amongst those that we see uh, our our progress um, is is uh, could be improved. Let's put it this way. So um, so there is there is a challenge to to really and also to find right indicators to measure progress, because as I said, for instance, to measure the spillover effects, for instance, is we have different research. I mean studies and 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 and, and research pieces where we can see that. Uh, like the uh, half of our natural consumption is is based in, in outside our borders, but to really, you know, find an indicator uh, to simplify that and to, to provide information that would would be applicable to decision makers to to really make uh, make measures to, to change this trend um, is is a challenge. Okay, thank and, you. and that's why we need cooperation internationally in the EU and then, of course, nationally. Thank you so much, Annika. And I know that the Finnish, I mean, there's so much tech innovation in the Finnish, in the Finnish uh, economy. It would be really interesting to have conversations to see how you could leverage all of that information and expertise in, in the digital realm again to sort of use digital tools and use digital incentives to really drive forward sustainable consumption, as you said, nationally, regionally and, and globally. We can talk about that. Uh, later on, I want to I want to move over to Karen and and learn more about the situation in in uh, Colombia. What are some of the national challenges that you face, Karen, um, in terms of getting access to the data and in terms of generating some of the actionable insights for sustainable consumption and production policies at the national level? Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation and for this event, and of course, congratulations for the release and the uh, goal in the twelve goal as you have. Uh, well, from Co in Colombia, we have also an SDG indicators framework. It was established uh, back in 2018. Uh, there is a policy document that was released in that year, and 
with this policy document that contains the path for Colombia to the achievements of the 23 agenda targets, it, we establish an indicators framework. So we also prioritize some indicators. In the specific case of the goal 12, we have kind of how of the targets prioritized in these policy documents. One of the reasons for that time to leave the other targets behind, let's say, it was that not all the methodological work was done. But currently, we do know that the IAEG SDGs has done an amazing work and we have methodologies approved for all indicators that are currently part of the global framework. So now with methodologies available that are not enough, but of course is needed in order to have a measurement, we have to start it to see and to close gaps in terms of measurement. We have an uh, interinstitutional task force with UN agencies here in Colombia, in which we also prioritize by year which indicators are we going to work. And in this exercise, we have seen that uh, sometimes sources of information are like the main bottleneck in the production process because you have all the technical support from the custodian agencies regarding methodological aspects and you can also uh, access to capacity building programs in terms of the calculations however if you don't have any source of data you 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 are like in a kind of bottleneck so i think that one of the main difficulties in our country for measuring SDG indicators is this one of uh, data. Uh, however, I also see that custodian agencies had also developed some strategies to collect data. And I'm, I'm going to talk specifically about one indicator to uh, give you an example, is the indicator of 12.7.1. This indicator has a, a approved methodology last year at the beginning of the 2020. And since this is a kind of tricky and innovative methodological work in terms of the measurement, so the custodian agencies took and took like the production process designed a tool for collecting data where to some countries to collect the data and all also, they calculate the, in, calculated the indicator. So I see that sources of information are one of the main bottlenecks, but at the same time, the way uh, mechanisms is also an alternative when countries don't have sources of information. And yeah. Thanks very much. So Thanks for it. That's, that's like the main, the main the main issue here and back to you. Thank you so much, Karen. And I'm and I'm and I'm I'm really um, encouraged by the fact that the SDG Hub is really meant to be a platform where, as you said, some of those methodologies uh, can be more easily uh, communicated, uh, can be more easily trained, uh, and it's really then meant to sort of help in that data collection process, the, the verification process, and the aggregation process and the reporting process. So. Uh, we'll we'll see. I mean, the jury's still out, but we'll see how much this adds value uh, to the national reporting process. And uh, it's really, really meant to 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 hit some of many of those challenges that you mentioned. So that's that's great to see that there's convergence. Um, let me continue the, around the panel. I wanted to pass it over to Yanis. Uh, same question to you, Yanis. David, I have actually four concrete suggestions for further developing the usefulness of the hub. First connect SCP performance indicators to societal well-being. If you look at any of the reports, including Global Resource Outlook, you will find that the developments in resource use are normally compared to the developments in GDP, so to the total value of production of goods and services. Our outlook, for example, will tell you about productivity, meaning how much GDP was produced per ton of materials extracted and so on. However, productivity per GDP is just a proxy and will not guide really balanced action. What would be more significant is to understand uh, is the productivity of resource use in terms of human well-being, so economic mm -hmm. security, equity, health, 
access to essential services, resilience to crisis, and so on. And GDP has long been used as a proxy to such well-being, but the developments in inequality, health, security in the last decades certainly point that we should reconsider it. That's the first. Second, connect SCP indicators to provisioning systems of societal function. To understand where resource use has been performing well in providing societal well-being, I think it is useful to analyze the data in categories of provisioning systems rather than economic sectors. For example, it is not meaningful enough to analyze the efficiency in the car industry if the country's urban system really don't need any more cars but better public transport. It would be much more meaningful to measure the productivity of resource use in providing well-functioning mobility system. It would be great to understand the resource footprints and efficiency developments in systems of mobility, housing, uh, nutritional health, for example, and everyday day consumption goods. Third, connect SCP data to life cycle impact data. While these resource use quantities, for example, in matrix of tons are meaningful indicators of sustainability, they cannot be translated directly into the climate, biodiversity and health impacts. So this is because different materials flow have different value chains and are used for different things for different impacts. Therefore, it would be important to connect data on resource use per provisioning system with evaluations of their environmental and health performance. So this would help identify, for example, those SCP strategies that have a multiplying positive effects. Uh, uh, finally, I think it would be important to connect data to the economic incentives that production and consumption systems are facing. It would be extremely interesting to not only record changes in material use and environmental impact of provisioning systems, but also the fiscal policies, regulations, investments, they are conditioned by, for example, in some regions, zoning laws prescribe detached housing design and thus prevent the development of more efficient multi-unit houses, while in other regions, legal and financial support to cooperative neighborhood ownership models has enabled retrofitting at scale. To conclude, we all know you cannot act on what you cannot measure. So I would really like to encourage all stakeholders, especially national governments, to take up the tools and guidance made available by SDG Hub to expand on your monitoring, on their monitoring and the reporting capacities. It will absolutely greatly serve their national needs, their national goals and policies. Act on it. Scientists are making the information available and financial resources exist. We need to move from setting goals to making our common goals a reality. And please do invest in telling stories framed for different stakeholders to make those data speak and count on RIP, IRP also in the future. We will be happy to explore further collaboration to closely connected uh, efforts uh, in whatever direction they will go. But I sincerely hope in the directions which I have proposed uh, in this contribution. Wow, Yanis, those are that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. If I if I got it correctly, it basically in a nutshell, connect SCP data, performance data to social well-being, to systems, not sectors, to life cycle data, to economic incentives, and to stories. I mean, fantastic summary of yeah. the five of the five dimensions. Really love that. I think the pens are probably blazing right now with people trying to capture that that insight. So thank you. Thank you so much. Richard, let me let me uh, pass the same question to you. Uh, if you could also offer either uh, some of the you know some kind of recommendations or any kind of uh, analysis of the barriers you see in collecting SCP data at the national level. It's hard to go after something uh, so so insightful, of course. But uh, um, uh, let me try anyway. I really. Um, um, recognize very myself very much in what Karen said earlier. So I, I can feel the difficulties there in uh, having a lot of guidance, uh, but not having the data. And of course that connects also to Janice's last point because that remains uh, a condition of course for, uh, for informed policy decisions. Um, we have, um, when it comes to company, re company level reporting on all of this, uh, we have issued uh, guidance on what companies can collect as core indicators in the 
economic, environmental, social, and governance areas. Um, so that the guidance is clearly there. There is a positive note there in the sense that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are doing a lot of case studies, uh, including in developing countries in Latin America. Um, and we do see that uh, it is possible, it is feasible to collect most of these indicators from companies, right? So it's not always the case that data is not available. But even then, of course, data is available only at the individual company level. And then, of course, the big problem becomes how do we aggregate all of this, right? And, um, and, and how do we make the data comparable between companies? And even if we have done a decent job of making data comparable, how do we go from having a sample of small sample of companies in a country to having some country wide uh, inkling on what's really happening? So I think I think that's where uh, a lot of the difficulty lies. And then perhaps, uh, given your, you asked me, do I have some suggestions on how to go there? Well, uh, I don't have many, but maybe there are some technical solutions that we could work towards in the future. On um, uh, given that there are so many reports out there by companies, um, and uh, of course they are they are all in different formats. They are all different differently written, but maybe there are some technical tools from web scraping to text analysis to ways in which we can try to go from the hodgepodge of company level reporting to some kind of meaningful aggregate indicators at national level to ultimately be able to integrate this at the at the level that Janus would like to see, um, or even just for national voluntary reviews or re national reporting on these indicators. Great, thank you so much, Richard, and thank you, colleagues, for that for that question. I think we're going to close that that question and move to another question. And I can see in the chat uh, we have a colleague uh, from DR Congo, from North Kivu Province, that's basically asking about capacity building. Right? We need capacity building. How do we get access to it? What is the SDG hub going to do to help build national capacity? Uh, and what you know, what are the capacity development tools that are really needed to to support better reporting? Uh, and data collection on this issue. So I, I wanted to talk about this capacity building question. And again, uh, maybe pitch it over to Karen to talk about sort of what are the capacity building needs that you face uh, and how uh, could this tool potentially help address those? Well, thank you so much. Uh, I see here that uh, this hub is relevant in all previously mentioned aspect. I also want to highlight that this goal is key from the multi-stakeholder approach because it's responsible consumption and production. And consumption and production is not only about action from governments and multilateral organizations. That's it involves private sector and civil society too. And with the release of this hub, everyone, everyone can check how the country is doing and not only governments. So I also see uh, this platform as a way to connect efforts and to articulate data production processes from every sector, from public sector, private sector, and also civil society. It actually, one of the comments that I heard from private sector is that we only have one indicator in the global framework to measure the contribution of the private sector. So I think that it could be like a one way is that you are putting in this hub available for everyone, not only for governments and not only for a, a institutes of statistics, what are the um, available tools for capacity building so private sector can also check what do you have here um i i, I also uh, agree completely and that this hub uh, help us in the last phase but not the least let's say a phase of the statistical production process that is the dissemination of results and here in Dani the main purpose of the communication strategy is to produce information for all this is our slogan so we clearly see a significant added value in all these data visualization hub and also I not all not every country has a platform where they can visualize uh, the results by SDG at national level. It, and summarizing, not everyone has a 
national platform for SDGs. And when there is no any national platform for SDGs, at least with uh, these two, you can have information about SDG 12. So I think that this is uh, like an amazing game. And also for countries like Colombia that already has a national platform, uh, you could see more than data here. And that's also a way policy site and overall, uh, it helps us in, 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 in seeing data as the key tool, not only for monitoring progress, but also as a key element for public policy design. So that's, that's what I think. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you so much for those insights. Uh, let, me, let me pitch it over to Annika again, same question. Uh, what are the main capacity building needs and how can this potential and how can this platform potentially contribute to those? Thank you. Um, I, I think Karen already said what I also wanted to say. I would actually formulate it as as we need we need a well established governance for sustainable development uh, for SDG 12. Yes, but broadly, more broadly, governance for sustainable development where we can discuss in a broad uh, dialogue, I mean, broad based dialogue between the, the statistici stat statisticians, experts, politicians, private sector, uh, NGOs, uh, and all kinds of data users. Uh, uh, we can have a dialogue on, on the data needs, uh, but also um, uh, how to best use use the indicators. So basically have a platform for, for such national dialogue. Um, we have in Finland a National Commission for Sustainable Development that has functioned uh, without interruption almost 30 years. It's led by, by the Prime Minister and we have um, a broad range of, of uh, stakeholders and ministries and, and different actors in, in that uh, commission. And under the commission, we have a um, kind of a um, monitoring or follow up and review network, which is a body uh, led by the prime minister's office, which has basically uh, uh, developed and designed and decided this national dashboard for SDG indicators we have in Finland. And um, and there we had basically uh, kind of a, a, all spectrums of the society involved. And that was, it was not only about, you know, uh, discussing uh, about the data and indicators, but also on, on values, on, on, on um, you know, how to make the change happen and, and more kind of a policy issues were also discussed there to create really joint understanding between between different actors uh, and, and in, in that way um, uh, build capacity nationally. And this applies, of course, in the international level. And this hub can, can uh, perform uh, as su such platform, if, if, if you like. Of course, we have One Planet Network, Charlie just mentioned at the beginning. We have national focal points within the One Planet Network. We have many things in place. We have the network in place, and and of course, it is a, so. We don't need to start from a scratch with this hub, and and I agree that uh, with the with one of the one of the um, participants who mentioned that uh, also the focal points or national focal points could be found in this hub, and 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 those are the. Uh, kind of um, issues that that people seek when they visit pages or websites like this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Annika, for again for those insights uh, at the national level in terms of capacity building. I'm coming to the two final questions, and these are these are kind of wild card questions. Um, the first question really gets to this 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 issue of kind of what are the next generation issues that the SDG hub. Uh, may want to begin considering. And I'm thinking here a little bit again about this idea that we are now in kind of this digitalization of the economy. And we're in this context where like 10 tech companies kind of have the power to influence the consumption behaviors of like 4 billion people on the planet, right? And they can influence 
those in one of two directions. They can either accelerate unsustainable consumption or they can use that power to really accelerate sustainable consumption in a circular economy. I'm wondering if you can comment uh, on, you know, how do we engage the, the tech communities and the platforms and all this technological power they have to start contributing to sustainable consumption and a circular economy? How do we begin engaging and what are the next steps? Maybe we could pass that question uh, first to Yanis. Yeah, uh, uh, David, I think that uh, in, at least in Europe, we have uh, seriously started with that kind of considerations already. And uh, there is, uh, when we talk about, uh, when, for example, European Green Deal talks about the future developments and, and uh, where our future competitiveness should be based, it's basically talking about greening and digitalization, which is recognizing the importance of digitalization in that uh, transition process. So. Uh, what is essential, it's exactly the question which you opened. So uh, how basically mobilize the digital community that it would be the core contributing factor to solutions rather than somebody who it's from a point of view of the only private interest, not looking to the uh, public interest, actually maximizing their, their own story. And I think uh, uh, this is pretty much, as I mentioned before, the same with all the technologies. And I think uh, this, is, uh, this is the real question which needs to be taken into consideration. So it needs to go hand in hand. So people need to sit around the same table and they need to work together so that they basically align the needs and the activities. And on the other hand, of course, the digital community have its own challenge because uh, uh, the data centers are becoming extremely energy energy uh, uh, consuming and uh, also as you know a lot of the uh, a lot of the waste which is connected to digital sector it's also an important question they have to answer so if you want to be credible in anything you do the first step it's always cleaning in front of your own doors then you can become credible Thanks very much, uh, Yanis. Let me, let's me pitch it over to Richard. Richard, same question. How do we begin to engage the tech community to drive sustainable consumption through this massive power they have to influence uh, you know, behaviors and perceptions and needs and wants? What's your recommendation in terms of maybe what the UN could do or how do we have this kind of systematic engagement and dialogue uh, in this domain? You're asking me a question that uh, on which I am clearly not qualified <laughs> to answer. Um, I mean, how do we engage the tech community? I, if I just go very down to earth on how we have done it and try to answer also the question that was there earlier on, you know, what is available in terms of technical uh, assistance, right, or capacity building. Uh, I mean, I think there. The tech community can really help and in our case you know at the really practical level it has already done so right uh, when it comes to sustainability sustainability reporting by companies and um, i mean the firms themselves need help especially the small and medium-sized enterprises and especially firms in developing countries but also the policy makers guiding this and pushing this need assistance in terms of you know, a plan for promoting sustainable uh, uh, reporting, sustainability reporting. Um, we we have always done this kind of capacity building work, but of course, under the circumstances over the last year, um, we've teamed up uh, with, with UNITAR to develop an e-learning course on this and to put all of our tutorials and all of our capacity building online for this. So uh, I think um, maybe it's not exactly the answer you were looking for, but in terms of a really practical example of engaging the tech community, helping us do this capacity building on SDG 12, I think that really helps. Thank you so much, Richard. I, I couldn't agree more that it always has to start with very practical orientation. And as you say, this is a critical need. And I think that's one of the big challenges, as you point out, is this, this asymmetry between sort of the power of the tech community but also the real importance of the, the small and medium uh, sized enterprises and, and making sure that they're also empowered to, to, to contribute to sustainable consumption and production. So thank you very much for those uh, insights. I'm gonna ask uh, Karen, if you want to uh, talk a little bit about 
the, the tech community in Finland and maybe what's it what it's doing to accelerate sustainable consumption and production? Sorry, that was uh, sorry, Karen. I, I, I said Karen. I meant Annika. Sorry about that. So Annika, if we could talk about the tech community in Finland, and then I'll and then I'll pitch it over to Karen to talk about Colombia. Okay, thank you. So you mentioned Karen and then Finland, so I was a bit confused. Well, um, yes, as you said, di digitalization is a, is definitely a, a key driver in in advancing sustainability and and circular economy and. Digitalization can be used to gain access to material specific data and, and resource consumption, which enables the product life cycle to be optimized for circular economy, economy solutions. And for instance, in Finland, we have uh, several digital solutions available. We have uh, a mobility as a service, mass, which is an integration of various forms of transport services into a single mobility service uh, which is accessible on demand and we have peer-to-peer -peer sharing platforms for cars and houses and different tools and and so far these um, uh, digital innovations and services have not been mainstreamed I would say but there is increasing interest towards them and, and especially in bigger cities and and we see a lot of potential in in them to contribute to more sustainable consumption and production. But of course, the, the data access and, and sharing poses also risks uh, if we want to capture data from non-state actors. For instance, we might face, for example, risks of breaching confidentiality and privacy and the violation of other legitimate private interests such as, as commercial interests. So, th so there are also risks that that we 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 re must remember and 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 um, consider um maybe finally if this is my last last word i would like to um comment um, janos uh, when janos mentioned about creating you know compelling stories and and i think this is a a underused opportunity also for sdg 12 to to really make the linkage to to narratives that are are positive and and that can uh, can bring you know hope hope in in uh, in 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 the implementation of the sdg 12 i think we know all the all the big challenges and 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 uh, urgencies that are there but also the possibilities and opportunities that and solutions that technology and 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 policies uh, can can provide uh, we must make them available as well to to all people in the world thank you thank you thank you so much annika and karen over to you and i apologize for uh for the for the mistake earlier i know that there, there's a vibrant uh sort of tech savvy community in colombia can you Tell us a little bit about what's happening in the Columbia scene and, and how tech companies and, and, and um, startups are really trying to lean into this sustainability and, and green technology space. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm going to approximate my answer from the statistical point of view. Currently, the legal and conceptual framework of the national statistics system allows to different organization regardless of the sector public private uh, or whatever uh, to produce official data the only request is that you fulfill the technical and the technical and quality assessment uh, so yeah but uh, with all this digitalization process we can also have more data available also there are challenges in terms not only of privacy and uh, overall in the whole data governance issue and the cycle of data but we also do know that digitalization comes with some quantitative cryptography uh, options uh, to manage some issues with uh, interoperability with security of data so from the statistical side we are uh, trying to go in the same way with the digitalization of the economy and take the most of all these 
data that is now available. So we are trying to work with private sector and we are also preparing ourselves internally from the technological perspective, also to the data protocols, et cetera, et cetera, to be ready to interoperate uh, all these data, new, let's say new data, or new sources of data and combine those kind of data with the data that we already have from the traditional sources. Okay. Wow, that's that's great, Karen. And I've been to Colombia and I know how much, how data rich your environment is. And it's really great to see that you're innovating in terms of who can contribute data, citizen scientists, companies. I mean, it's fantastic. It sounds like the world has a lot to learn from the Colombian context and how you're dealing with this. So thank you very much. We have uh, two minutes left in this panel before we do the wrap up. I want uh, each panelist to make one commitment, 30 seconds, uh, one personal commitment on how you plan to either use or promote uh, this new SDG 12 hub. So we're gonna start uh, with Annika, please. 30 seconds, your one commitment. Um, I will connect my, uh, Finland is leading one of the 10 YFB thematic programs, which is sustainable buildings, buildings and construction. And I will connect my uh, colleagues working for that program with the uh, with the SDG 12 hub, and make sure that uh, their data and information is available in in the hub. Great, thank you so much, uh, Karen. Let's move it over to you. What's your one commitment? Okay, we are currently in an audit process of sustainable public procurement carried out by an inspection organization here in Colombia. So all national entities are under this process. And with this data hope, we are ready now to incorporate new indicators in the national framework that we previously haven't incorporated because we have, haven't done like the statistical process now with this uh, with the release of the uh, this hub we have data for some indicators and we can incorporate directly these indicators in our national framework and also invite a uh, public policy entities to check not only the data but what are the insights beyond all this data that is being published today for our country back to you wonderful Thank you so much, Karen. Excellent. Uh, Richard, what is UNCAD going to commit to in terms of uh, taking the hub forward? Well, it's easy. I'll just expand on the questions I just tried to answer in the chat. <laughs> we will make sure that our uh, guidance materials uh, for promoting sustainability reporting, uh, tutorials, e-learning, and all those things are all um, accessible through, through the hub. So we try to uh, to to, um, to to help the people who just uh, uh, answered ex or asked exactly those questions in the in the chat and uh, and make sure that this happens. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much, Richard. And last but not least, uh, Yanis, uh, co-chair of the International Resource Panel. What is your one commitment to take forward uh, the hub? Yeah, hub. It's absolutely an excellent initiative, and uh, my commitment is to make IRP useful for SDG 12 hub. I think we are already now providing uh, this global materials flows database. Uh, we know that most countries in the world do not have capacity to establish national material flow accounts, but they are absolutely necessary for policy making. So we try to be and we will be a reliable partner. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all panelists for engaging in this conversation. A lot of insights that came out of, of this exchange. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and again, uh, congratulations to the team that put this together. It's a beautiful website, and it's so good to have all of this data in one place, to be national, to be global, and to really be able to extract the insights for policymaking. So thank you again. Um, we are, uh, one quick note of, of housekeeping, in terms of next steps, uh, we're gonna try to continuously improve the hub, and we will be embarking on a user experience exercise in the coming two months. So you will all be invited to participate in this exercise, to provide your feedback on how the hub may serve your needs in tracking and implementing SDG 12. Um, the custodian agencies of SDG 12 are committed to further developing the hub, and we really need your feedback uh, to make it as good as 
possible. Now I'd like to close uh, by turning to my colleague, Sheila Agarwal-Khan. She is the director of the economy division in UNEP for a few closing remarks. Thank you, David. Uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear, Sheila. Okay, good. Um, and apologies because the camera doesn't seem to be working. But um, thank you for moderating the session and thank you also to the participants for all the insights to the roundtable. To the panel chair, um, panel participants, Janusz Batochnik of the International Resource Panel, Richard Baldwin of UNCTAD, Annika Lynn Blom of Finland, Karen Quintero of Colombia. Um, thank you for this rich discussion. Today's conversation really reaffirms the importance of SDG 12 in the journey towards the 2030 targets and the urgent action needed on sustainable consumption and production. Uh, we see the SDG hub as being the first step in that direction. And it's not simply about just getting data in, but as you've discussed in this panel, it's about the interactive uses of it, to be able to explore solutions that could benefit you all and to be able to look at the explore action section, which has and will have more policies, guidelines, tools, case studies, so that countries and different stakeholders can see what others have done to be able to learn from the lessons that are out there, to be able to draw on best practice. Most important in the SDG hub is going to be looking at what you all want as users. So we're going to be conducting a user experience um, survey in the next few months. We want to know what you want out of that SDG hub. Remember, at the end of the day, the information is only as good as what you tell us you want to, to get out of it. And so we're looking to working with you on this tool and hoping that you'll be able to get uh, soon after this onto the sdg12hub.org and see what it does. If it works where you think it can improve, please feel free to come in and volunteer to be one of the um, stakeholders testing it so that we can learn directly from you on what you're looking for. And thank you again for a fantastic panel. Wonderful. Thank you, Sheila. And I'm so happy that you have a user-centered design approach to the development of the hub and you're looking for feedback to constantly improve and iterate. That's really the only way to develop a platform these days. So colleagues, we've come to an end. We're one minute over the, uh, the deadline. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, all the panelists. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you for this wonderful exchange. Please do have a look at the hub. If you're not watching the soccer game, please have a look at it. If you are watching the soccer game, then tomorrow morning shall be fine. In the coming weeks and months will be fine, but please have a look at it, send us your feedback and begin to uh, see how this incredible tool can really help in this journey uh, towards uh, collecting data and collecting insights on SDG 12. Thank you again, everybody.